Chapters eighty one to eighty four of Tristram Shandy, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie van Mulligan. The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentlemen, Volume three by Lawrence Stern. Chapter eighty one. To conceive this right. Call for pen and ink. Here's paper ready to your hand. Sit down, sir. Paint her to your own mind, as like your mistress as you can, as unlike your wife as your conscience will let you. Tis all one to me. Please, but your own fancy in it. Blank page. Was ever anything in nature so sweet, so exquisite? Then, dear sir. How could my uncle Toby resist it? Thrice happy book, thou wilt have one page at least within thy covers, which malice will not blacken, and which ignorance cannot misrepresent. Chapter 82 As Susanna was informed by an express from Mrs. Bridget of my uncle Toby's falling in love with her mistress fifteen days before it happened, the contents of which express Susanna communicated to my mother the next day. It had just given me an opportunity of entering upon my uncle Toby's amours a fortnight before their existence. "'I have an article of news to tell you, Mr. Shandy,' quoth my mother, "'which will surprise you greatly.' Now, my father was then holding one of his second beds of justice, and was musing within himself about the hardships of matrimony, as my mother broke silence. "'My brother Toby,' quoth she, "'is going to be married to Mrs. Wedman.' "'And then he will never,' quoth my father, "'be able to lie diagonally in his bed again as long as he lives.' It was a consuming vexation to my father that my mother never asked the meaning of a thing she did not understand. "'That she is not a woman of science,' my father would say, "'is a misfortune.' but she might ask a question. My mother never did. In short, she went out of the world at last, without knowing whether it turned round or stood still. My father had officiously told her above a thousand times which way it was, but she always forgot. For these reasons, a discourse seldom went on much further betwixt them than a proposition, a reply, and a rejoinder, at the end of which it generally took breath for a few minutes, as in the affair of the breeches, and then went on again. "'If he marries, t'will be the worse for us,' quoth my mother. "'Not a cherry stone,' said my father. "'He may as well batter away his means upon that as anything else.' "'To be sure,' said my mother. "'So I hear and the, the proposition, the reply, and the rejoinder I told you of.' "'It will be some amusement to him, too,' said my father. "'A very great one,' answered my mother. "'If he should have children—' "'Lord, have mercy upon me,' said my father to himself. Chapter 83 I am now beginning to get fairly into my work, and by the help of a vegetable diet, with a few of the cold seeds, I make no doubt, but I shall be able to go on with my Uncle Toby's story, and my own, in a tolerably straight line. Now. Four very squiggly lines across the page, signed I-N-V-T-S and S-C-W-T-S. These were the four lines I moved in through my first, second, third, and fourth volumes, alluding to the first edition. In the fifth volume, I have been very good— the precise line I have described in it being this, one very squiggly line across the page, with loops marked A, B, C, 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 D. My which it appears that, except at the curve marked A, where I took a trip to Navarre, and the indented curve B, which is the short airing when I was there with the Lady Boussière and her page, I have not taken the least frisk of a digression till John de la Casse's devils let me the round you see marked D. For as for C, 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 they are nothing but parentheses, 
and the common ins and outs incident to the lives of the greatest ministers of state, and when compared with what men have done, or with my own transgressions at the letters A, B, D, they vanish into nothing. In this last volume I have done better still, for from the end of Lefebvre's episode to the beginning of my uncle Toby's campaigns, I have scarce stepped a yard out of my way. If I meant at this rate, it is not impossible, by the good leave of his grace of Benevento's devils, but I may arrive hereafter at the excellency of going on even thus. Straight line across the page. Which is a line drawn as straight as I could draw it, by writing master's ruler, borrowed for that purpose, turning neither to the right hand or to the left. This right line, the pathway for Christians to walk in, say divines, the emblem of moral rectitude, says Cicero, the best line, say cabbage planters, is the shortest line, says Archimedes, which can be drawn from one given point to another. I wish your ladyships would lay this matter to heart in your next birthday suits. What a journey! Pray, can you tell me, that is, without anger, before I write my chapter upon straight lines, by what mistake, who told them so, or how it has come to pass, that your men of wit and genius have all along confounded this line with the line of gravitation. Chapter 84 No, I think I said I would write two volumes every year, provided the vile cough which then tormented me, and which to this hour I dread worse than the devil, would but give me leave, and in another place, but where I can't recollect now, speaking of my book as a machine, and laying my pen and ruler down crosswise upon the table, in order to gain the greater credit to it, I swore it should be kept going at that rate these forty years, if it pleased but the fountain of life to bless me so long with health and good spirits. Now, as for my spirits, little have I to lay to their charge, nay, so very little, unless demounting me upon a long stick, and playing the fool with me nineteen hours out of the twenty-four, be accusations, that on the contrary I have much, much to thank him for. Jolly have you made me tread the path of life with all the burdens of it, except its cares, upon my back. In no one moment of my existence that I remember have you once deserted me, or tinged the objects which came in my way, either with a sable, or with a sickly green, in dangers ye gilded my horizon with hope, and when death himself knocked at my door, you bade him come again, and in so gay a tone of careless indifference did you do it, that he doubted of his commission. There must certainly be some mistake in this matter, quoth he. Now there is nothing in this world I abominate worse than to be interrupted in a story, and I was at that moment telling Eugenius, a most tawdry one in my way, of a nun who fancied herself a shellfish, and of a monk damned for eating a mussel, and was shewing him the grounds and justice of the procedure. Did ever so grave a personage get into so vile a scrape? quoth Death. Thou hast had a narrow escape, Tristram, said Eugenius, taking hold of my hand as I finished my story. But there is no living, Eugenius, replied I. At this rate, for as this son of a whore is found out of my lodgings, you call him rightly, said Eugenius, for by sin we are told he entered the world. I care not which way he entered, quoth I, provided he be not in such a hurry to take me out with him, for I have forty volumes to write, and forty thousand things to say and do which nobody in the world will say and do for me, except thyself. And as thou seest he has got me by the throat, for Eugenius could scarce hear me speak across the table, and that I am no match for him in the open field, had I not better, whilst these few scattered spirits remain, and these two spider-legs of mine, holding one of them up to him, are able to support me, had I not better, Eugenius, fly for my life? "'Tis my advice, my dear Tristram," said Eugenius. Then, my heaven, I will lead him a dance he little thinks of, for I will gallop, 
quoth I, without looking once behind me, to the banks of the Garonne, and if I hear him clattering at my heels, I'll scamper away to Mount Vesuvius, from thence to Joppa, and from Joppa to the world's end, where, if he follows me, I pray God he may break his neck. He runs more risk there, said Eugenius, than thou. Eugenius's wit and affection brought the blood into the cheek from whence it had been some months banished. It was a vile moment to bid adieu in. He led me to my chaise. Allons, said I. The postboy gave a crack with his whip. Off I went like a cannon, and in half a dozen bounds got into Dover. End of chapters eighty one to eighty four.